Hey, yo, what's good, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Bros Talk MMA. I'm your host, Utica, undeniably the illest cat around, a.k.a. Mr. Make This Pick Real Quick, a.k.a. Mr. On My Scruffy. Okay, we are in the midst of No Shave November. I'm here with my bro host extraordinaire. You know what it is. It's Ray Bucks. It's Michael Jordan. It's Ray Mysterio Jr. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We are here to cover what will be the second to last pay-per-view event taking place here in 2024. It's UFC 309. We got the undisputed heavyweight title on the line. We got John Jones going up against Stipe Miocic. It's going to be a 13-fight card. We're going to start things off in the flyweight division. We got, in the women's flyweight division, we got Veronica Hardy going up against Eduardo Mora. We got Hardy coming in 4-4 four four in the UFC, 9-4 and four with one draw overall, 4-1 and one in their last five fights. We got Mora coming in. They are 1-1 one one in the UFC, 10-1 and one overall, and 4-1 and one in their last five fights. I'm going to be going with Mora in this one by sub or decision. They're going to be the bigger fighter of the two. They got the edge in the grappling. They're actually uh, moving up to flyweight from the strawweight division. Uh, I believe they're doing this to avoid uh, depleting themselves and being able to last a little bit longer in the fights, have a little bit more strength and power. Um, they got more routes to victory, in my opinion. Um, they're always looking for the finish. And uh, we got Hardy coming in. They're going to be the smaller fighter. Uh, definitely a, a point fighter, um, decent everywhere, but not necessarily dangerous anywhere. Um, if if Mora lets her stick around long enough or gives her an opening, Hardy will definitely take advantage of it. But I just believe Mora uh, should be able to redeem herself from her last fight and make a, a fresh beginning here in the flyweight division. I got to agree with you. Uh, I think uh, more packing on the pounds is going to be a good thing for her. Uh, she is a finisher more so than Veronica Hardy is. Uh, Hardy's a, a, a good fighter. She's just not a great fighter. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the decision machine that she is, like, I, I can't go with her. I've got to always go with the, the one that's going to finish. So uh, Eduardo Mora is going to be my pick. So for sure. Moving on to the men's welterweight division, we have Oban Elliott going up against Basil Hafez. Uh, we got Elliott coming in 2-0 in the UFC, 11-2 overall, and they're currently on a seven-fight win streak. We got Hafez coming in. They are 1-1 one one in the UFC, 9-4 with one draw overall, and 3-2 and in their last five fights. I'm going to be going with Elliott in this one by decision or sub. Um, they're going to be the younger and taller fighter of the two. Definitely uh, the more well-rounded, in my opinion. Um, has a good gas tank. Should be able to uh, keep this on the feet, but definitely able to hold their own on the ground. But I just think that uh, the path of least resistance would be if they keep this on the feet, maybe mix in a little bit of grappling just to wear on Hafez's, uh gas tank. But uh, we got Hafez coming in. They're the older fighter by six years. They're going to be the shorter of the two. Um, they got power, but I just don't know if they're going to be able to keep up with Oban's uh, pace. Uh, I feel like they're going to have to do something early or get something flash uh, for this to go their way. Otherwise, I'm going with Elliott in this one. I'm going to agree with that pick. I've got to go with Oban Elliott as well. Um, I think you, you are calling it right that he will win. Um, by sub or decision, um, he's just a better fighter in my uh, opinion. Uh, he, like you said, he is on a seven fight win streak, um, so I just don't see any way that he doesn't get this done against uh, Hafez. For sure, for sure. All right, staying in the welterweight division, we got a bout between Mickey Gall going up against Ramiz Brahmaj. Um, we got Gall coming in six and six in the UFC. Seven and six overall, and one and four in their last five fights. We got Brahamaj coming in. They are two and three in the UFC. Ten and five overall, and two and three in their last five fights. Um, I'm gonna go with Gall in this one by decision or KO. They're gonna be the bigger fighter. Uh, 
Now, I'm not like super confident in this pick. Uh, it's not like I want to pick Gall, but out of these two fighters, given their skill sets, uh, I just feel like Gall has a little bit more routes to victory, although they can be chinny and uh, their gas tank can be questionable at times. I just think in this fight between these two, uh, he should have the advantage given his, his height and his reach. Um, I would probably say the X factor in this would be his striking, so I would suggest he keeps it on the feet. Brahamaj uh, is coming into this fight, the smaller fighter, and he's going to be the grappling specialist of the two. That's literally how he's gotten all 10 of his uh, wins. He's probably going to look to get this to the ground ASAP. But uh, being that he doesn't have any real threat on the feet, even given Gaul's, you know, uh, weak chin. Damn, son. I still would say that uh, he, he, he has nothing to offer him on the feet. So, therefore, that would give uh, the edge to Gaul for me. So I'll be going with Gall. I got to go with Mickey Gall as well. Um, you're right. He has hands. They're not great hands, but they're hands. Um, whereas Brahamaj has literally no hands. Um, and they're, they're both great grapplers. Um, and I don't think that Brahamaj has a, a significant uh, a level up on Mickey Gall's grappling. Uh, I think they're pretty, pretty equal in that um, area. And so that's why I've got to give it to Gall as well. Uh, because he does have hands and he does have the ability to, uh, you know what I mean, throw some punches out there. And uh, hopefully gives him a, a little bit uh, more uh, routes to victory. Yeah, definitely. All right, folks, moving on to the heavyweight division. We got a bout between Marcin Tybura going up against Janata Denise. We got Tybura coming in. They are 12-8 and eight in the UFC, 25-9 and nine overall, and 3-2 and two in their last five fights. We got Denise coming in. They are 2-0 and in the UFC and are undefeated at 8-0 and overall. I'm going to be going with Tybura in this one by either decision or sub. They're going to be the older fighter by six years. Slightly smaller of the two, uh, but I would say more well-rounded. Um, they're definitely going to have the edge and the grappling. Um, I would suggest that they get this fight to the ground, but just without having to sacrifice their energy. Um, I feel like they should be able to get Denise to the ground pretty early, but Denise is going to be the younger and slightly bigger of the two. Definitely a powerful striker, always looking to finish. Um, you know, I feel like he'll be able to uh, maybe avoid some takedowns early in the fight, but if Tabura you know, barring him not having depleted his gas tank, you know, can start, you know, just keep coming at him with, with more takedowns as the fight goes on. Eventually, I think that he can, you know, start to uh, take over. Um, so, yeah, as long as he doesn't run into any of the power shots that Denise has, I think that um, Tabura can take this one home. Uh, unfortunately, that's incorrect. Um Joanna Denise has the power in his hands. Uh, he is quite a bit younger than him, and I just think he's going to punch the shit out of uh, Ty Bora. Now, Ty Bora is the better grappler. I don't think that's going to matter because he's going to need to get in close enough to grapple with Denise, and Denise is just going to pick him apart as he's trying to get those uh, get those takedowns. Um, so that being said, I've got to go with Denise. He's the undefeated fighter, um, and if you don't have a blueprint to beat him, I can't believe you need to beat him. Sure, sure, sure. All right, folks, moving on to the featherweight division. We got Roberto Romero coming in against uh, David Onama. We got Romero making his UFC debut, eight and three with one draw overall and four and one in their last five fights. We got Onama coming in. They are four and two in the UFC, 12 and two overall and four and one in their last five fights. I'm going to be going with Onama with this one by KO or Sub. They're going to be the older fighter by six years, taller of the two, uh, well-rounded, probably, uh, I would assume, uh, has the edge in the grappling department, uh, but also potentially in the hands as well. They definitely carry power in their hands. Um, they got the more UFC experience. 
Um, I would say maybe the cardio is the only thing that I've seen them, you know, raise concern with in the past. But I also believe that they've been shoring that up as well. Um, I just feel like maybe, you know, if they mix in a little bit of the grappling, but primarily keeps this standing, uh, that would be their route to victory. But at the same time, too, I also just think that this is a tr contractual obligation. Uh, from the UFC to just get him a fight before year's end. So they're just bringing Romero in. Who the fuck uh, is that guy? They're going to be the younger and shorter fighter. Uh, <laughs> I said Romero. Huh? Uh, Romero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shout out to my guy Romero, though. Um, he's going to be the younger and shorter fighter, somewhat well-rounded. Um, but at the end of the day, they're just coming in on super short notice, doing the company a favor. I don't really have a lot of info on them. So uh, unless they pull something out of the fire or just show that they are UFC caliber just right off the bat, this would be, you know, pretty, pretty uh, ill upset, you know, out of the card, even though it's the newest card being or newest fight being added to the card. Uh, this fight literally just got added like on a Tuesday evening. So, um, you know, he could, you know, be that dude and comes in and, you know, kind of shocks the world, even potentially steals a bonus from someone on this card. But uh, I just don't see it happening. So I'm going to have to go with Onama. I'm, I believe David Onama is being uh, fed a fresh meal right here. Uh, I, I just think he's, he's going to eat him alive. Uh, I don't. Roberto's coming in, uh, never had UFC experience, uh, coming in on a Tuesday for a fight on a Saturday. Um, has never, you know what I mean, hasn't really had the ability to train for this fight. Uh, so I think this is an easy dub for David Onama. Um, he's just the, he's the UFC veteran in this uh, particular situation. Um, 12 and 2, I mean, I just, I, I don't see how, how this new booty's going to come in here and make something happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> moving on to the lightweight division, we got Jim Miller going up against Damon Jackson. Uh, we got Miller coming in 26 and 17 with one no contest in the UFC, 23 and 7 with, oh, I'm sorry, my apology, 37 and 18 with that one no contest overall, and 3 and 2 in their last five fights. We got Damon Jackson coming in 6, 5, and 1 draw with one no contest in the UFC, 23 and 7 with that one draw and one no contest overall. And two and three in their last five fights. Um, I'm gonna be going with Jackson in this one. This was a last minute change up. Um, I believe they can win this by either decision or submission. Um, I changed my mind because of uh, reasons between these two at this point in their career and who they faced and who they've won against versus who they've lost against and. When you uh, add it all up, Jackson has just faced a stiffer competition. Um, he's going to be the younger and taller fighter of the two, a uh, striker that can grapple, but I believe in this bout will probably have the edge in the striking. Um, they're not as dangerous to me as Miller on the ground, but, I mean, that's actually, you know, just kind of, uh, that's just my assumption. Uh, to be totally honest, they could be just as dangerous if not more dangerous than Miller. Um, but in my opinion, if they keep this standing and at distance and avoid those grappling exchanges, I think that they can, you know, just stand back and kind of uh pick Miller apart. Miller's gonna be the older fighter by five years, the shorter of the two. Definitely the more skilled grappler, at least in my opinion, from what I've seen. A super vet in the game. Dog fighter, um, but it was shown in his last fight that you know the the younger, you know, more highly skilled strikers, you know, can give him trouble. So I think you know Jackson's kind of in the middle road between that. He's not quite a young guy, but he's definitely not as old as Miller, and definitely has some hands. Um, so. Unless Miller's able to find some type of like sneaky submission or catch him early, I think that uh, Jackson is actually going to. Uh, I don't know if Miller's going to retire after this, but I feel like Jackson's going to 
send uh, Miller home with his uh, second consecutive uh, UFC loss in the 300s. Yes. Um, Damon Jackson, in my opinion, is the superior striker. Um, I think uh, Jim Miller edges him out very slightly in grappling, um, but I think that's the striking is what's going to give the problem to Jim Miller. Uh, Damon Jackson has a lot of power, a lot of speed, um, and it, it is just a, a better striker. Um, I don't – Jim Miller's 41 years old, bro. I'm not <laughs> betting on 41-year-old dudes, you know what I mean, towards the end of their career anymore. Uh, so I've got to go with Damon Jackson on this one. Okay. I feel you. I feel you. Moving on to the middleweight division, we got Chris Weidman going up against Eric Anders. We got Weidman coming in 12 and 7 in the UFC, 16 and 7 overall, and 2 and 3 in their last five fights. We got Anders coming in. They are 8 and 8 with one no contest in the UFC. 16 and 8 with that one no contest overall and 2 and 3 in their last five fights. I'm going to be going with Anders in this one by KO or decision. They're going to be the younger and smaller fighter, powerful striker who can grapple. Um usually that is in the style of leaning on his opponents, getting them up against the cage, you know, wearing on their energy and then finding openings for like power strikes in the in the midst and or Possibly finding an edge in the wrestling and just controlling them, ground and pound, top position, all that good stuff. Um, you know, he just has to be effective early, though, because it has been shown, you know, as the fight wears on, he will start to fade and slow down. Um, so hopefully he can do that before Weidman, um, who's going to be the older fighter by three years in this fight, definitely on the uh, latter, latter end of his career. Um, he's going to be the slightly bigger of the two, well-rounded, but uh, at this point is just past those golden days. Um, he's playing with fire more so than ever now with that leg that he broke not too long ago. I think this is probably his third fight off of that break. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised given that this is uh, at MSG. He's a, you know, Long Island guy. This could possibly be him, you know, taking his ride off into the sunset. But I haven't heard any mention of that. So I can't say that that's, you know, his mindset or anything going into this. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's the case. Um, but all in all, he's going to have to hurt Anders early with something and uh, get him out of there quick, you know, to avoid having to have this fight go any longer, which I feel like, if it goes to uh, the late rounds or decision, even given Anders, you know, sometimes being like slowing down, I think that Weidman will probably uh, be just as tired, if not more. So uh, I'm going to have to go with Anders. I got to agree with the Eric Anders pick. Uh, Weidman is towards the end of his career. Um, and Anders is a strong, powerful, fast striker. Um, who's going to give Weidman a lot of problems, especially in that first round and uh, early in the second. Now, will he start to fade if it does go past that amount of time? Yes. And then that's the only chance that Weidman has is that uh, Andres fades. But I just don't think we're going to get that deep into it. And I think there's going to be a KO in the second round. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on to the men's bantamweight division. We got Jonathan Martinez going up against Marcus McGee. We got Martinez coming in 10 and 4 in the UFC, 19 and 5 overall, and 4 and 1 in their last five fights. We got McGee coming in. They are 3 and 0 in the UFC, 9 and 1 overall, and are currently on a five fight win streak. I'm going to be going with McGee in this one by KO or decision. They're going to be the older, more uh, powerful striker, you know, in terms of the hands. Um, they definitely got a little bit of wrestling in their back pocket that they can pull out from time to time, mix things up, kind of wear on their opponent's energy and or just keep it close so that, you know, they're not uh, getting uh, picked apart from the outside. They can pretty much give Martinez a run for their money anywhere that the fight goes. But regardless of where the fight goes, the one thing that they got to be aware of is uh, the leg kicks. 
Um, Martinez is the younger fighter. Um, a striker with devastating leg kicks. Um, he's going to look to keep this on the feet. Uh, he's going to look to use those leg kicks to break down McGee, take the pop off of his shots. And if, you know, McGee uh, lets him stick around long enough and takes enough of him, he's, he's been known to KO folks with these leg kicks and I think may have the most leg KOs in the UFC. I'm not quite sure about that, but I'm pretty sure. Um, so yeah, um, in his last fight against Aldo, he showed that if somebody is, uh, equally as aggressive and or more aggressive and is able to, you know, cut that distance and not allow a lot of those kicks and or check them and, and even dog their way through some of them, you know, you can start to, uh, wane on Martinez's confidence, you know, start to, uh, you know, get him to second guess what's going on. And, you know, of course, these are things I'm sure he's gone back and looked at and are, is trying to work on. But I do believe McGee is of the same caliber to bring that kind of aggression that can overwhelm him. So I'm going to be going with McGee in this one, giving uh, Martinez their second consecutive loss. I got to agree. I got to go with Black Danny Trejo as well. <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta go. With him. I gotta go with uh, <laughs> Chef Boyar McGee. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I just think he gets it done. I think he's gonna have more aggression. I think he is gonna close the distance, um, and, and not let uh, Jonathan Martinez pop off those leg kicks, um, because that is his main game plan, and that's really how he gets it done here in the UFC. And I think Marcus McGee can just go ahead and uh, and uh, avoid that by closing the distance and being more aggressive than he is. Um, so I think McGee gets it done uh, by K or decision. Oh, yeah. And then afterwards, he'll go home and make a big bowl of chili. Yum. There you go. That's a cooking channel. <laughs> go check out Marcus McGee's <laughs> cooking channel. <yeah. laughs> uh, moving on, we have a lightweight bout. Uh, starting off the main card, it's going to be Mauricio Rufi going up against James Lontop. We got Rufi coming in. They are 1 and 0 in the UFC, 10 and 0 overall and are currently riding a five fight win streak. We got Lontop coming in. They are 0 and 2 in the UFC, 14 and 4 overall and 3 and 2 in their last five fights. I'm going to be going with Rufi or Ruffy. There's one of the two uh by KO or decision. They're going to be the older fighter uh, by three years, longer of the two. Um, dangerous striker, always looking for the finish. Um, has a great gas tank and can carry their power over three rounds. Um, I feel like for him, as long as he controls the pace, you know, puts the pressure on him on top and kind of uh, tracks him down, uh, he, it, as long as uh, he he can uh, manage his energy. I feel like, you know, he'll be able to, you know, eventually clip Yon, Yon Top, get their, uh, get their chin somewhere in the midst. Um, Yon Top's going to be the younger fighter, taller of the two. Uh, he's going to be a striker. He doesn't have any real grappling. Um, even then, I think if it did go to the ground, Rufi would have the, uh, advantage there just given you know his fight team you know uh he's coming out of the fighting nerds so he's uh got barajo you know in there he's got folks that you know he can uh get some good looks from uh whereas Lontop, he's never really shown any grappling prowess um definitely dangerous but not as aggressive as rufi or ruffy um so he's just gonna need to clip him hurt him early get him out of there Outside of that, I think this is a uh, Rufy, Ruffy, uh, Rufio, <laughs> whatever uh, his Brazilian name is. Rufio. There you go. Uh, it's his fight to win. <laughs> it's his fight to win for sure. Uh, I've got to agree with the with the Rufy uh, pick. Um, I think it is his fight to win. I I don't see a lot of a uh, good looks from Long Top. He is a and O and two in the UFC, um, and I believe Rufy's just going on up. Uh, I also I think this is one of the higher uh uh odds bets uh i think rufy right now is like a negative 750 um so obviously the odds makers believe in him so and i i believe in him as well uh so i've got to go with rufy okay 
For sure, for sure. Moving on to a women's bout in the flyweight division. We got Kareem Silva going up against Viviani Arujo. We got Silva coming in 4-0 in the UFC, 18-4 overall, and are currently riding a nine-fight win streak. We got Arujo coming in. They are 6-5 in the UFC, 12-6 overall, and 2-3 and in their last five fights. I'm going to be going with Silva in this fight by either Sub or KO. They're going to be the younger fighter. Grappling specialist, I would say, uh, you know, they can strike, but they're definitely going to be having the edge in that department over Arujo. Uh, they're strong, getting better with every fight. They just need to manage their energy and make sure that they don't burn it looking for uh, submissions early in the fight or finishes early in the fight. Um, Arujo, uh, they're going to be the older fighter. Somewhat well-rounded, um, you know, they, they can definitely wrestle and uh, they like to strike. They like to look for that knockout sh shot, but, you know, most times that just ends up with them uh, going to decision. Um, at this point in their career, I would say against Silva, they'll want to keep this on the feet, not want to go to the ground. Um, keep it at distance, try to clip them or find something some type of sneaky standing submission but outside of that uh i feel like again this is just a, a fight for silver to win kind of a changing of the guard you know i think this is i think you're absolutely correct i think this is a uh, corinne silva's fight to lose um arujo is just a decision machine in my opinion um she's not a killer she's not a finisher um is she a a a, a decent uh, ufc fighter yeah decent but not a top 10 UFC fighter, and unfortunately, I don't think she's going to break into the top 10. Are you sure uh, about that? Against Corinne Silva. Uh, Corinne Silva is going to sub her, going to KO her, going to be more uh, aggressive. I'm just going to put that out there. Arujo is going to be the higher ranked of the two fighters, and I believe she is within that top 10. Just putting that out there, or that top 15. This is that, that's not the same rankings. Are you sure? Yeah. What a dumbass. Either way, I believe Korean Silva's better. Um, I'm based I'm basing it off of uh topology rankings and not UFC rankings. Uh but yeah, Arujo is not um going to get this one done. Korean Silva for the win. For sure, for sure. Moving on to the middleweight division, we got Bo Nickel going up against Paul Craig. Who's mad at this uh guy? we got Nickel coming in three and oh in the UFC. 6-0 overall. Uh, we got Craig coming in 9-8 with one draw in the UFC. 17-8 with one draw overall and 1-4 and in their last five fights. Um, I'm going to be going with Nickel in this fight by either KO or decision. Um, they're the younger, shorter fighter. They're a high-level wrestler. But I feel like in this fight, given that they do have some power in their hands and are, I feel like, evolving and learning, they're going to want to, you know, showcase some of that new uh, striking that they got, you know, to a point, you know, unless it starts to go in the other direction for them. But I feel like uh, going to the ground would be easy for them to do, but there is a danger there with Paul Craig Brother, uh... because... Uh, Paul Craig, although they're the older fighter by eight years, they're going to be the slightly taller of the two, and they're a sneaky grappler. I just feel like the only things going against them right now is that this is uh, their fourth middleweight fight, which middleweight hasn't been too kind to them since they've entered the division. Uh, they moved down from the light heavyweight division. Um, they're kind of chinny. They fade as the fight goes, but until you know, the bell rings or, you know, the ref pulls somebody off of him. He's always live for a finish. Uh, well, just one of those guys who knows how to win, especially in the midst of adversity. But uh, he doesn't really have any hands. And, uh, you know, like I said, Nickel is more than skilled on the ground and could probably beat him there as well, but does have some hands. And I feel like, you know, that's just more routes to victory. 
So uh, I'm going to have to go with Nickel over Paul Krieg. It's not funny! I've got to agree with the Nickel pick. Um, Paul Nickel's just on the UFC uh, Hype Train Express right now. Um, and he's got Uncle Dana backing him. Um, I think uh, we're just we're just wa- watching a, another fight for him to win um, just to kind of uh, creep up those rankings. Um, he's undefeated. Uh, and I think he's going to remain undefeated uh, against Paul Craig. And uh, Paul Craig just seems to have lost a lot of uh, a lot of power uh, coming down from the light heavy um, to 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 one eighty five. Um, so I think this is uh, Bo Nichols' uh, fight to lose, and uh, hopefully he doesn't. Um, but he's also the minus one thousand favorite. So again, the odds makers agree with me. <laughs> yeah. So beware. Yeah, that could be, be the, the biggest parlay buster. Of the year. No. <laughs> uh, it would be sad. It would be quite sad. Uh, moving on to the co-main event, we got a lightweight bout between Charles Oliveira going up against Michael Chandler. Uh, we got Oliveira coming in. They are 22-10 and 10 with one no contest in the UFC. 34-10 and 10 with that one no contest overall. And 3-2 and two in their last five fights. We got Chandler coming in. They are two and three in the UFC, twenty-three and eight overall, and two and three in those last five fights here in the UFC. It's literally it's, <laughs> anyway. I'm gonna be going with Oliveira in this one by sub or decision. They're gonna be the younger, bigger fighter, grappling specialist. Uh, but they ain't afraid to throw hands. Uh, super vet of the UFC just in particular uh dog fighter always dangerous again one of those dudes that unless the bell rings or the referee's pulling uh you off them is always live for a finish in the fight i believe they have the most finishes in the UFC um all they got to do really is just manage their energy and avoid uh power shots from Chandler uh Chandler is the older fighter by 3 years Smaller fighter, but super, you know, stocky, muscular dude, uh, explosive, um, dangerous, striker, you know, super power in his hands. Uh, he can grapple, but he's not going to want to do that with Oliveira. He's a, he's a dog fighter. He likes to make the, the fights interesting. He like, you know, he would prefer to just, you know, stand in the pocket and just throw blows and see who falls first. But uh, he tried that with Oliveira. He actually had, you know, Oliveira pretty, pretty uh, dead to rights in their first fight. And, uh, you know, the Bronx was able to weather the storm and then eventually, you know, get a, a KO of his own in that fight. And I just believe that, you know, after a long layoff trying to chase that big payoff fight with McGregor, I just think that uh, Chandler's just going to, you know, be a step behind and, you know, just not be quite the guy even that he was in that first fight with Oliveira, let alone, you know, coming into this second fight off of a two-year layoff. Um, I think he just has to catch Oliveira with something uh, early, you know, flash KO and actually end it this time around and not get overzealous like he did last time or he'll lose it just like he did. Uh, the first time, um, I'm gonna be going with Oliveira in this one. I've got to agree with the Oliveira pick. Um, Michael Chandler has had too long of a layoff for me. Um, it's been two years since he's been in the cage. I know he was waiting for the McGregor fight, that never came, and so it's not his fault. But again, I believe there's gonna be some ring rust there. Um, Oliveira's a finisher. Oliveira's already punched his ticket once, so I believe he's gonna punch it again. Um, Oliveira is just the, the more well-rounded fighter. Michael Chandler does have better striking, um, mainly uh, just but with hands than I think Oliveira does, but not so much that he outclasses Oliveira. So I've got to go with Charles Oliveira in this uh, in this particular matchup. So for sure. Moving on to the main event of the evening. We got the undisputed heavyweight title on the line. We got two legends of the sport going at it. We got John Jones, the light heavyweight king, now heavyweight king, 
going up against the former heavyweight champion in Stipe Miocic, who holds the title for most defenses by a heavyweight in UFC history. These two are going to be squaring off in Madison Square Garden in about that you know, some people will say is not their favorite. They don't love it. Uh, they think maybe somebody else should be in there with Jones. Me personally, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Cry. Cry. I don't care. <laughs> Motherfucking John Jones is the GOAT. Arguably one of the greatest fighters to ever uh, partake in combat sports. Uh, but definitely in the UFC in specific, um, they're going to be the younger fighter in this fight by five years, the longer of the two, uh, super well-rounded, um, can pretty much win this fight anywhere that it goes. But if you were to ask me where I think he wins this fight, I think it's going to be on the feet. Um, as long as he stays hyper-focused, and doesn't play around with Stipe, I feel like, you know, as long as he can, you know, really get things going early on, batter him in that first two to three rounds, and in my opinion, even keep it from going into the fourth and fifth and or to a decision, I mean, he's he's more than capable on the ground, but I just think that he has such a diverse uh, array of strikes that he can literally just keep Stipe guessing the entire time, pick him apart, uh, you know, wear him down, and eventually get that finish and, and even get like a submission finish. But, you know, that's whatever. We got uh, Miocic coming in. They're the older fighter, uh, well-rounded. Uh, I would say that, you know, they prefer to stand as well. Um, they got good striking. I don't think it's on the level of Jones. Um, they got good takedown defense. They got, good, if things do go to the, the ground in the top position, they're, pr they're pretty dangerous. Um, I just feel like, you know, in this fight, he could mix it up, but I just don't see where he has the advantage. I don't know where he gains the advantage in this fight outside of, you know, Clipping Jones, hurting him with something early. Uh, you know, Jones get gets injured, aggravates an injury. I don't know. But I just, I don't know outside of him out-dogging Jones and taking him into, like, the fourth and fifth round and, you know, potentially, like, really, like, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, yeah, just outlasting him. I really uh, don't see how he wins this fight. So, uh, Given that this is only John Jones' second uh, heavyweight bout, and he has mentioned things about, you know, having to carry a bigger frame and a bigger body, I still believe that, you know, this is something that he's had on his mind since he got the belt and is going to, uh, you know, carry out that mission this Saturday against Miocic. Yeah, I think we're talking about motherfucking John Jones here. Uh, as you said earlier, one of the greatest fighters to ever do it, uh, definitely the greatest heavyweight to ever do it, uh, or not heavyweight, uh, light heavyweight to ever do it, um, and currently carrying a fucking heavyweight title. Uh, he's going to outperform Miocic in, in all aspects of striking, um, even though Miocic likes to stand and strike. Uh, I think uh, he maybe, maybe falls slightly short of Stipe. In the grappling, but not by much. Not so much that he's even close to being outclassed. Um, and he's just going to show you, show him so many different looks, so many different striking angles. Uh, he's going to be the faster fighter, in my opinion, as far as uh, striking come, goes. Um, and he's just going to pick him apart. Uh, I think this one ends by KO. Uh, more than likely, I think it ends by KO in the third round. Um, I don't, I don't think we're getting the deep water on this one. And uh, I'm just happy that Jones is back. As am I. To everybody who, you know, is a Jones hater, says he's ducking Aspinall, or, you know, thinks that uh, 
he's foul if he, you know, goes with fighting um, Pereira or just, you know, uh, rides off into the sunset. You know, y'all just y'all y'all ain't familiar with John Jones. That's that's just pretty much what it comes down to. Tom um, Aspinall can't carry John Jones as a jockstrap. You know? He can't. He can't. And I told people, I believe you and me had a conversation about this, and I'm sure, sure you can go back and check it out. I said Jones was not going to give Aspinall the time of day, and I believe it's mostly in part due to just respect. And I feel like, like I said, Aspinall don't need to be like an ass kisser, but the way he let the public, you know, basically goad him into talking down on John Jones, which I get it. Maybe Jones is new to the heavyweight division. Maybe he doesn't have the accolades in the division that he has had in the light heavyweight division, but he's still y'all, he's still the champ. He beat the guy who was considered the, you know, top contender at that time. Uh got it done. And yeah, Aspinall technically is next in line, but we're talking about a dude's legacy here. We're talking about, you know, a guy who, if if that 12-6 elbow uh, rule change was around back then, he'd be fucking 28-0 right now. You know, and really, if if you know and have been around the game like I have, you know that that fucking defeat doesn't matter anyway and that he is undefeated and that, you know, outside of, certain asterisks against certain victories and things like that. He is the greatest. And I mean, you can't take that away from somebody, no matter what you want to say. Like if, if he wins this fight and decides to call it hey, more power to him. If he decides he wants to fight Alex Pereira instead of Tom Aspinall, more power to him. I really actually hope that does happen. Me too. And I, I understand it because Pereira had respect. You know, he said that, you know, yeah, a fight with John Jones would be dope. But to be honest, I'd just like to train with a legend like that. And it's, no. and it's not because he's fucking kissing ass. It's because he understands. Yeah. He understands, like, what he's talking about here. He's not being a clout chaser, in my opinion. You know, that's all Tom Aspinall's trying to do is, is gain some clout. I get it. He is the, the, the young up-and-comer in the sport book. What has he accomplished in comparison to John Jones? What has he done uh, for the UFC, you know, that John Jones hasn't? Yeah. And I, I just I don't think he – that's going to be a high – sell. I mean, if they did it in the UK, it might be a high-selling fight, but it's not – I know it's a fight that people are calling for, but it's not one that, like, if you are a true fight fan, you really give a shit about. Mm -hmm. um, Jones Pereira, jo though? Jones Pereira? Absolutely. I want to see that. Jones Peloton? All day. But, like, like Asma, great. I mean, I'm sure it would be a, a decent fight. Yeah, I'm sure he'd um, give Jones a run for his money and possibly could win. I'm not, I'm not saying he isn't fit for the job. I just feel like his approach was fucking horrible. It was. I, I can ag agree with that. And again, I would rather see Peloton anyway. Cool. Well, folks, uh, that concludes our picks and predictions portion of the show. Um, Parlay God, can you uh, bless us with, uh, you know, three piece at the least? What, what we got? I got a fiver for you. Okay. I, got, I got the fever five. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start off with Onama, followed up by Anders, then McGee, then Rufy, and then end it all up with Bo Nickel. Okay. okay. For, the, for the Nickel Five. All right. All right. I see you. I see you with the five piece. All right. Well, I'm going to see your five piece, and uh, I'm going to raise you two. So uh, I'm going to go with a base four with Onama, Anders, Rufi, and Nickel. Uh, if you want to spice things up, you know, you can throw Kareem Silva into the mix. And uh, if you want to get really spicy, you can go ahead and throw in uh, an Oliveira 
and a spicy Jones on top of that. Uh, seven piece parlay. Well, oh, I feel good about this. I feel good. I feel pretty solid about this parlay as well, too. I think we're we're, we're kind of right there. Um, and I have I just have a tough time. I have a tough time of adding too many more to my parlay. That's that's my issue right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only one I would consider potentially adding to this mix is uh, Oban Elliott, but I don't I don't want to push it. Yeah, you know. But uh, yeah, folks. Um, real quick, just want to thank everybody for watching, all the subscribers, uh, new viewers. Uh, if you don't know, make sure that you check us out. Uh, we just got added to the list of the official UFC prediction tracker. Shout outs to Robin. Uh, he just added us to the list. Uh, go and follow his channel. I'll put the link for it in the description. I think his channel's only been around since like April. So, um, you know, he's, he's gathering information as he goes. I believe at this point he's covering over a hundred channels. He's getting them all together and, and breaking down who had uh, the most wins, most losses, who was the most profitable coming out of the card. But uh, all in all, you get to check out how we stack up against the competition. I believe in this uh, last episode, which was our uh, first time entering into the arena, uh, we actually did very well and would have done what most would consider, you know, like it would have been like top 10, top five performance, but it just so happened with how wonky the Magni Prates card was that everybody ended up doing really well and even some cats even picking a perfect card. Perfect. So, uh, but... Um, make sure that, like I said, you check out, motherfucker, uh, you check out, uh, the UFC predictions tracker, um, see how we stack up against the competition and also, you know, see, um, how good other channels are doing and, and hip yourself to some new channels and some new personalities and, uh, broaden your, uh, betting horizons. Um, but yeah. Uh, like I said, again, we'll have that channel's dis uh, link in the description. Um, outside of that, uh, make sure that you follow us on IG um, at Bros Talk MMA. You can follow my bro here, r1.mason. You can follow me at Utica underscore SME. You can also follow us on TikTok at Bros Talk MMA. Um, also, make sure that you like, share, and comment, and subscribe to this channel. We appreciate all the new subscribers, all the new viewers, uh, you know, whether it was from, you know, our appearance on the UFC Predictions Tracker, or if, you know, you just happen to come across us just on your own. We salute you. Thank you for watching. And, uh, yeah, you got anything? Uh... Just to say that I'm 100 fights up on the year. Oh, wow. Okay, yep. With that being said, direct your attention here to where I'll be posting a graphic letting you know what our all-time picks and percentages are. This is the 39th event of the year. We started our channel at the beginning of this year, uh, starting with that first event. Um, we're 38 events in with uh, the 39th taking place this weekend. Uh, once again, this will show you uh, all of our picks and percentages leading up to this weekend. Um, right now, Bro's in the lead. He's picking it at a 60% rate, 61% rate. He's 100 fights over, you know, and wins uh, over losses. And uh, I'm over here, you know, I'm picking a high 50%. Um, we're both green on the year. And, uh, yeah, it's been a great year. Uh, there'll be 42 events in all once uh, 2024 closes. We'll get a little break, and we'll be back at it again. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. But uh, until then, this has been another episode of your favorite MMA, UFC, picks, predictions, and sports betting channel, Bros Talk MMA. I'm your host, Utica, undeniably the illest cat around, a.k.a. Mr. Make This Pick 
real quick. Looking scruffy as fuck with my bro host extraordinaire. You know what it is. It's Ray Bucks. It's Mr. Give Me My Belt. Hand me my crown. Fun fact, this is our second taping of this episode because my phone and or the app that I'm using to record this in was being a little bitch. <laughs> but we're here. We made it. I'm no longer angry. And uh, yeah, just looking forward to a solid weekend of picks. And uh, until the next time, happy betting. We wish y'all nothing but the best this weekend. And until the next time, we out.